All right, we're going to, uh, so welcome everybody. We're going to take it away and Nicholas Gaspard is going to do the introductions. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Um, thanks everyone for um, showing up to the second virtual uh, NORS symposium. Uh, it's the second time we're doing this. We did one last year, it was a success, but I hear that this year is even better with more than 200 participants um, registered to, um, to participate. So, um, as you know, the, the symposium will take place over two days, tomorrow and today, two, two hours and a half. T today is um, about medical and, and, and scientific um, developments in, in the field of noise and fires, and tomorrow will be about uh, families. Uh, oops. How do I... Um, Larry, can you move to the next slide? I, I can't be... I, I can't seem to be able to do it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so before we, we, we go into uh, a bit of more details about the, the symposium, there are a few people uh, I'd like to um, to thank. Uh, first of all, Nora Wong, that all of you know by now. Um, she, she's been behind all our efforts uh, for Norse and Fires for more than uh, five years now. Um, she's the executive director of the, the Norse Institute, and she's just an amazing person. So thank you very much, Nora, for everything you've done so far uh, for, for, for the field of putting in all the... Uh, scientists and, and physicians interested in ocean fire together to uh, advance the field. Uh, thanks a lot to Larry, uh, who is the, the co-chair of, of the, 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 advisory, the advisory board of the, of the Institute. He'll be also moderating today's um, symposium. Um, thanks also to Krista, uh, we'll be moderating to, to the, uh, tomorrow's symposium with, with the families. She's also a member of the advisory board. Uh, thanks very much to, to Jorge for uh, coordinating uh, the research on ORS and helping us setting up this, uh, this symposium uh, together. Thanks also to Carol and, and Marta from Yale uh, who have been helping us with, with Zoom um, as we were kind of surprised by the number of people who uh, said they were going to show up and we had an idea. We didn't have the resource to, uh, to make it happen without, without them, so thank you very much. Um, thanks to all the members of the Advisory Board, of course, for doing great work um, uh, last year. Um, thanks to all the speakers who will be speaking today and, and, and tomorrow. And of course, um, thanks to everyone uh, who has shown up, will show up. Uh, next slide, Larry, please. Um, this is the, the program for today. I'm not going to go into the, the details. Uh, you will hear from a, a bunch of different people. Uh, we've done amazing things over the last year uh, about Norse. Uh, you will hear about Ronnie uh, concerning the, the Delphi study he, he has done and, and the great results he has achieved uh, with a group of experts who, who gave their input. Um, you'll hear about uh, case management uh, from a panel of, of experts, Jim Riviello, Emily Kumor, Ingo, Elbik, Al Musco, Mike Wilson, and, and Larry will be presenting the case. So this is a great uh, slate of experts that are going to give their expertise about all the aspects of, of Norse and fires from uh, uh, pediatric intensive care, adult intensive care, genetic uh, immunology, and, and infectious disease. So, so really tackling the, 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 the case from all the uh, possible angles. There will be a message from uh, family by Ms. Musetter and, and Ms. Ways. Uh, Raquel is going to talk about communication about Norse on social media, very important issue to raise awareness about. Uh, Norse and, and fires. Uh, we'll have a short break and then uh, a quick uh, presentation of cutting edge research on Norse and fires from Aurelia Anna, uh, Eleonora and Anita and, and Jorge uh, about different aspects from uh, very basic immune mechanisms of Norse, neuropathology and, and uh, clinical evidence of the seasonality uh, of Norse. And, and then at the very end, Larry will be uh, presenting the, uh, the very new biorepository of noise that's been um, set up at, at Yale. Um, if you go to uh, the website of the North Institute, you'll find a lot of information about North and fires or three things I'd like to uh, pinpoint for you. Uh, next slide, Larry, please. Um, so Larry will talk about the biorepository, which is actually the, um, the, in the continuity of the uh, registry and biobank. We've started uh, four years ago now. Uh, it's been set up through the Critical Care uh, EG Monitoring Research Consortium uh, with, the help, uh, with the help of um, the Yale Neurology Department. Uh, so this is all falling into the biorepository now uh, where we'll get uh, lots of link information and also samples from patients with Norse and fires from all over the, the world. Next slide, Larry, please. Um, there's also, uh, if you go to patients and families, there is also 
a link to the family registry that's been set up by Tim Gafton uh, in, in London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, this is a registry that's available for patients, families, but also physicians worldwide, uh, where you can enter uh, data, clinical data, but also outcome, long-term outcome data and burden of care data, a very important aspect of caring for the patient with, with uh, NORS and, and fires. It's available in uh, English, French, German, Spanish, and uh, Mandarin Chinese. I hope I haven't forgotten one language, but it's been translated in, in many, many different languages. So it's available for uh, families and physicians uh, worldwide. And the very last thing I'd like to, um, uh, to uh, tell you before uh, moving on, Larry, last slide, please, is that you also have a fantastic list of um, commented articles on, on North and Fires. It's great work that we started years ago now that's been expanded through the year of, uh, thanks to the help of uh, Zubida, uh, Jorge, Andres, and Balwin, Larry, uh, we've put together the, what we think are the important references uh, from the literature on, on NORS, fires, and treatment for uh, these conditions, uh, what we know about the mechanisms, and how to treat refractory status of use in, in general. So please uh, take a look at these reference lists. It will give you a lot of information about uh, these um, conditions. And with that, I'm, I'm done. So thank you very much for, for joining us and I hope you will enjoy uh, the symposium. I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you will. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicholas, uh, for that and for everything you've done for Norse and uh, co-chairing the Medical Advisory Board for the Norse Institute and, and everything else. And with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Ronnie Wickstrom. So he's a professor of Pediatric Neurology at the Karolinska in Sweden, and he has been leading our extensive Delphi survey and publication that will be out relatively soon. So, uh, Ronnie, I believe you're going to share your own slides. Let me stop. Can we try that? Yep. Uh, give, it, give it a try. Is that working? Can you see the slides yep. now? Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Larry, and thanks, Nicholas, and thanks to everyone for um, uh, letting me present these uh, data, which I'm doing on behalf of this um, uh, fairly large consensus group um, working with uh, Norse and Fires, many of whom are on this um, call today. So I'm happy to present these uh, things. With I presented these data before, so some of you may have seen it. And just like Larry said, we're uh, just about now, uh, we're undergoing review again for uh, having it published fairly soon. So first, let me just touch upon why we decided to embark on this um, consensus approach um, uh, for North and Delphi. The, uh, I guess there can be several reasons. In our case, the, the, the main reason is when you're trying to develop um, uh, recommendations or, or guidelines of, of some sort for anything, it's um, uh, it may be a problem if there is not so much solid data to base these recommendations on. And this is, of course, the case in, in Norse's and fires, as you know. Um, there, there are uh, quite a lot of publications now. Um, there are over 1,300 patients that have been described, different ages and different presentations, but um, a fairly large group. But these are all retrospective case control studies or case series or even case reports. And there are uh, no randomized cl clinical trials or even non-randomized clinical trials. So uh, the, 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 um, the quality of the data is, is um, quite low. Also, <clears throat> and this is probably part of the reason why there aren't so many uh, good studies, it's, it's a hard condition to study, uh, both from the sense that it's rare, so that every, each one of us are going to see fairly few uh, cases. And also, it's a very hyperacute uh, thing, which makes uh, designing studies very difficult. And, and we'll see that. And, and, and the, the, one, if you're not having uh, a standardized treatment protocol and sampling protocol, you're gonna end up with a lot of uh, heterogeneity in the group, which is uh, indeed the case here. The lack of data also comes when it come, uh, when concerning effective treatments or, or treatments as a whole, a very uh, limited amount there. And, and also when it comes to outcome data, they're difficult to interpret because the outcome parameters or the variables in the outcome data are are uh, also heterogeneous between uh, different groups or different studies. This um, slide is taken from one of Nicholas and his co-workers papers that was published in 2018 and then summarized uh, what was known on uh, treatments. 
And uh, this mainly con this concerns, uh, these aren't the um, anti-seizure medications, which per definition don't work, but um, what, you, uh, what this slide shows is a summary of, in the left column, fires cases, in the right column, Norse cases and different kinds of treatments. And you can see on the left-hand side, there was there starting with steroids. And then the number of treatments and the positive effects as they're perceived. Again, this, these are heterogeneous studies, so it's, uh, it's defined differently. Um, and with the exception of hypothermia, as you can see in the middle here, I don't know if you can see my little pointer here. Does that show when I'm, okay, very good. So, so these are only five cases, but um, uh, looking at the percentage of perceived positive effects, you can see these are very, fairly low with the exception possibly of, of ketogenic diet. And we'll come back to that uh, sooner, but not much is working. And this, this goes to both uh, fires and, and NORS. One final uh, or uh, uh, an important thing uh, in, in trying to um, uh, deciding to do this was uh, not only uh, trying to uh, overcome the problem of not knowing the pathophysiological mechanism, but also try to use this uh, process as a foundation for future studies and trying to create observational studies and a registry. And, and we'll come back to that during the meeting today because that's already up and running and also try to create common data elements. So we're talking the same language and, and set a foundation for a research consortium that can uh, actually perform these studies. So we set out to generate a consensus guideline for the treatment of NORS, and we decided to use the Delphi method. And for those of you who are not familiar, the idea with the Delphi method is that you have a question that you want to answer or several questions. In this case, it's uh, is the uh, treatment of NORS and fires and also workup. And then you uh, select a panel of experts that you define in one way or another. And a smaller group, part of the, the, of the expert panel, will design a survey containing statements. And then uh, you'll have the full panel discuss these statements and see if you have consensus on these uh, statements or not. If you do have consensus, it's, then you summarize it. If, the, if you don't achieve consensus, uh, and, and I'll come back to how this is defined, you uh, try to, the, the smaller panel, the facilitator group, We'll try to revise the statement and then you'll go around in this circle until you uh, finalize uh, the conclusions there. So we initiated this at the AES meeting in 2019. Uh, the facilitator group was established just shortly after that. And then uh, just shortly after that, we established the Delphi panel. And you can see here there was 48 people on the panel, which is a very large panel for being a Delphi panel. Um, you can see the distribution over the world there and the distribution between adult and pediatric. Um, you can see it's a very heavily based in, in North America and Europe, which is something we should address in, in future uh, studies, of course. Um, the expertise among the panelists, you can see here, they're both neurologists and epileptologists from adult and the pediatric side and also um, neurocritical care um, from a pediatric and adult. And then there were also uh, two pediatric rheumatologists who are working, have been working extensively on, uh, on um, this is issues, on these issues that were on uh, the panel. So we did this early February, 2020. And um, then we had a little a delay due to, the, uh, due to the COVID pandemic, but um, um, we finalized it in the end. The methodology here <clears throat> that we used is um, we um, phrased statements and then the panelists were, uh, asked to answer on a nine grade scale where one is I strongly disagree and nine is I strongly agree. And the definition we use, there are different definitions for Delphi methodology, but this is the one that is most commonly used, um, is that a consensus that this a statement, that the statement in question is appropriate if the median score is seven or above, and that it's inappropriate if it's below three. Also, we rate the disagreement. So even if you reach a, a, a consensus up here, if more than one third is down in the opposite part or up here, if that's the opposite part, then that's uh, considered disagreement. And I'll show you how this um, works. But we calculated the median scores. The definition that we use for consensus was for the whole group, adult and pediatric, but we've cal calculated and we show them uh, both for adult and pediatric, the medians. We also calculated the level of agreement and disagreement. And for uh, each statement, this was either it achieved consensus or it was revised or uh, discarded. The results ended up in five sections. It concerns disease characteristics, 
we have a lot of statements concerning tests and sampling and work of Menorah's virus, and then two sections on treatment. One is the acute phase, and one is the, uh, the post-acute phase, which we define as the, the resolution of um, status epilepticus. And then a final one concerning research and registries. Um, before we uh, distribute the uh, Delphi, we performed a pre-Delphi questionnaire, not only to collect some baseline data, but to address two important questions that we weren't sure on how to uh, address. First one was whether we should address NORS and fires jointly, and the second one was whether we should uh, address children and, and adults jointly, and the de decision by the full group was to do that. So uh, there's only one um, Delphi performed here. And um, after, so we started out doing this in January 2000, uh, 2021. We formed 20, we had 81 statements, and then we had also seven open questions to form basis for future statements. We had, amazingly enough, 100% response rate. And as you can see there, we uh, achieved consensus for some of these um, questions, most of them actually. Some of them we did uh, rephrase because of comments and, and um, that were um, put forward by the, the, the um, panelists and then four were not uh, carried forward. Uh, the second round was in April, 2021. We had 28 statements, again, uh, full response rate and consensus for all 28. So in the end, the consensus document consists of 85 statements and two figures that I'm just gonna uh, show you shortly here. Uh, too many, of course, to go through all of them. This is what it looks like here. Uh, for If you look at the first statement, there's this diagnosis of NORS may be given for persons of all ages. Um, you can see the, the median uh, score here and median for adult pediatric and also then the level of agreement. And those are the ones uh, that scored seven, eight or nine and the level of disagreement that is one, two and three. But as you can see, sometimes the level of agreement is fairly, is lower. Like, if, like in this one here, it's 75% agreement, but only 2%, only one person has in, in the opposite part. So many people would just check in the middle at a five stating, I, I don't know. So um, as you can see, there are some statements here. This may be of interest. I've highlighted some that I think that are important uh, concerning inflammatory activation in this case, that it precedes and probably contributes to the persistence of seizures in Norse and fires. Um, and then there are some more disease characteristics. The second part concerned workup and uh, statements um, 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 covers a lot of these areas, including what serum investigations, what CSF investigations should be formed um, concerning MRI, uh, different kinds, genetic testing, and, and also metabolic testing. We also have a couple of questions in here concerning uh, CSF cytokines, uh, as you can see here. And I'll just pop through here in the interest of time. When it comes to treatment, um, and all the statements uh, uh, achieved consensus in the end. You can see the decision or the statements um, state that the acute treatment should be similar both for anesthesia medications and for anesthetic drugs. And the important things is perhaps to uh, state that, um, and this is where, where it differs from regular status epileptic treatment is that um, first line immunological treatment should be started during the first 72 hours. And, um, the second one is that ketogenic diet should be initiated uh, during the first week. And this is somewhat differently phrased in the end, but you can see here that this was not, did not achieve consensus in the adult group, but it did in the pediatric and it achieved it as a whole. When it, uh, concerning the question of whether um, the respondents were, could start ketogenic diets, almost everyone responded that they were able to do so. Um, also that if, uh, immune treatment, first-line immune treatment, uh, isn't uh, given, hasn't given, given an, an adequate response within the first week. Second-line immunological treatment should be started within seven days of seizure onset. And that second-line immunological treatment should be based on etiology. And I'll come back to that when I show the, uh, the, uh, uh, the treatment algorithms or the flow charts in the end. When it comes to post-acute uh, treatment, there's no real evidence to support any specific anti-seizure medications. Uh, there are some statements concerning follow-up treatment of ketogenic diet, immunomodulation, and um, cytokine, cytokine um, antagonists. 
The final section concerned research and registries, and this is partly what we're discussing here today. And there was a very, uh, um, a very solid consensus that we need multi-center international efforts to do this, that we should be uh, working against uh, developing a registry in a database, which Larry will come back to later on today, and also to try to initiate uh, intervention trials. But as you can see at the bottom there, uh, it uh, is a discussion on, on how to do this. There, is consent, there was consensus in the group that it should be head-to-head -head trial um, with um, cytokine receptor antagonists, and but this was um, still debated and, and exactly how to do this is not, um, we don't go into that in this study. So this all led up to these two flowcharts, and I realize you can't see them here, I'll just go through them shortly. It's one concerning workup and one concerning treatment. Um, the one in the workup um, is based on um, a paper by Claudine Scullier and, and her colleagues, and it's divided into a standard workup, um, you can see there, and also a selected workup on, on, on selected cases, including, a, uh, including immunocompromised patients, um, specific exposures, and then uh, if you, this is suspicion of, of metabolic disease, genetic disease, and also um, there are some statements concerning um, going to brain biopsy if you have a targetable lesion. The second flow chart uh, concerns treatment. And again, what we've done here and what differs from regular treatment is that on the left-hand side, we have a timeline trying to emphasize that during the first two or three days, uh, this is similar to a regular uh, treatment of status epilepticus and, and, and the refractory status epilepticus. And then if you at 72 hours, that is three days, if you still have a NOR situation with an incomplete response to initiated treatment, and, and you haven't identified an etiology, this, uh, we recommend that you start first line immune therapies. And this can be steroids or IVIG, and you can combine them, of course. Um, one of the statements that was discarded actually, and we don't uh, discuss is use of plasma exchange. And uh, it says here that it may be used, but it shouldn't delay subsequent steps, because that was uh, one of the, uh, the, the dangers or the, the problems that were, were raised here. If the response, as I mentioned, is not complete, the recommendation is that within seven days, initiate ketogenic diets, absolutely in children, and to consider in adults if you have it available, and also to start second line immune therapies. And if you have an antibody mediated um, NORS, then rituximab is the uh, choice, or if, if it's cryptogenic, or if you don't uh, um, have a clinical picture that's, that's compatible with an antibody mediated, then you'd recommend going to either one of these uh, cytokine inhibitors. So to summarize uh, this very quick run through of what we found, it's um, we uh, conclude that, that the speed in the diagnostic workup is essential. This goes for all status epilepticus, of course, but, but in this case, definitely. And then that uh, targeting immunological mechanisms has the potential to alter the prognosis. And um, that um, is defined as if you still have at 48 to 72 hours, have uh, a cryptogenic case, start first line immune therapy, and then within seven days, start ketogenic diet and second line immune therapy. And then um, we'll try to use these uh, data as a foundation for uh, the ongoing planning for, for future um, research. And I want to acknowledge and, and, and um, just send thanks to all this, um, this very large group for um, a fantastic collaboration. Of, and of course, to Nora uh, Wong as well has been part of this. Thanks. Thanks, Ronnie. That was a fantastic overview of a ton of stuff. As you can see, we could have spent two yeah. hours on that. Um, all right, I get, uh, we're gonna move on to our case, which will be basically putting all this into practice and there'll be uh, time for questions discussions at the end of the case or you can put questions in the chat now uh, to Ronnie and uh, we'll either discuss them or he can answer in the chat all right let me uh, we'll move on to our case management with expert commentary and I'm going to Try to share this right. Does that look right for you people? You, uh, okay, let's move on. Um, let me know if there's any problem seeing the 
Okay, I'm going to I'm going to present a case. Uh, the details of the case are not that crucial, but it's a great uh, platform for jumping off on some management questions. And we have experts from different areas, adult, beads, intensive care, rheumatology, etc, who will comment on it. Um, so this is the case of a 22 year old young man uh, who uh, did very well in schools an athlete became a teacher and a basketball coach. Uh, his only history is listed here, scarlet fever and asthma earlier in life. He developed one week of low-grade fever, headache, nausea, and photophobia, then had one convulsive seizure, was admitted to another hospital where he had five focal impaired awareness seizures. That's the new name for complex partial seizures. Um, we had some face twitching and uh, loss of awareness with those. The seizures persisted despite four medicines. He was transferred to Yale. Um, on an initial exam at our place, he was sleepy, disoriented, and then had a focal impaired aware seizure during the exam. Uh, here's an example of one of his seizures. The main point is this, it's an obvious seizure and it's coming from the right side. And then soon after he would have a very similar one coming from the left side. Um, so he was having about four seizures an hour. Um, some had clinical manifestations, but they gradually went away and be he became more impaired and it was harder to identify any discrete seizures. He had bilateral uh, highly epileptiform patterns as well and diffuse slowing. Uh, on initial workup, his MRI was normal. Uh, lumbar puncture, the spinal fluid showed normal protein and glucose. He did have 13 nucleated cells that were mostly lymphocytes, um, and his HSV was negative. So the initial diagnosis was that this was both Norse and the subset of fires because of the uh, fever he had for almost a week. Um, and he had a huge workup, and the only thing found was some positive mycoplasma titers, where his IgM, suggesting a recent infection, was positive and turned negative. Um, this was uh, more than eight years ago now, because I have eight years of follow-up for him, but um, we were not measuring cytokines then. He did not have metagenomics or genetic testing. This is some of the things he was treated with, a, a variety of high doses of medications for seizures, including midazolam, propofol, pentobarbital, ketamine, so all of our anesthetics. Um, These are the uh, maximum doses he reached of all these drugs, mostly very high. He was treated with acyclovir initially, steroids um, for five days at high dose, and the moxifloxacin for possible mycoplasma. Um, but he was not given any other immune treatment, thinking that mycoplasma was the etiology. He had uh, many adverse events, like most of these people with long intensive care stays. Uh, he developed pancreatitis and myelitis, were thought to both be related to mycoplasma, which has been reported to do both of those. A repeat MRI a few weeks into the hospital stay sh showed some restricted diffusion and increased signal in the medial left temporal lobe, uh, which were thought to be the sequela of seizures rather than the cause, but be from seizures. Uh, he did develop um, what was really a propofol infusion syndrome but he wasn't on propofol at the time. So he had severe acidosis and rhabdomyolysis uh, while on high dose of midazolam and ketamine. Um, and he had a very brief cardiac arrest, a collapsed lung, uh, deep vein thrombosis and a tracheostomy. Um, so at this point, we're gonna move on to our discussion and our, uh, these are our expert commentators. We asked five people if they could make some comments. And our first one is from Michael Wilson. Uh, before we go on there. Um, so Michael Wilson is from UCSF and he's a world's expert on metagenomics. And we asked him to comment on what the role of that is for this case. Um, and unless, unless he joined, I believe he's not here. And he sent was he, he had to uh, round in the hospital, so he sent us a video. Um, so I'm going to go ahead with that. If he's on here, somebody stop me and we'll let him do it live. But. 
Hello, my name is Michael Wilson. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm sorry I can't be there live as I'm uh, rounding in the hospital this morning, but I wanted to provide a short commentary on the potential role for metagenomics in this case. So just as a quick summary, this is a case of a 22-year-old man with one week of low-grade fever, headache, nausea, and photophobia that then progressed to the fire subset of Norse. Uh, his while his brain MRI was unremarkable, he did have mildly inflammatory spinal fluid with 13 white blood cells that were lymphocytes, which is important um, when we think about um, the potential diagnostic yield for metagenomic next generation sequencing. So as a, a quick primer on what the technique is, so typically when we diagnose a neurologic infection, we use um, a hypothesis-based approach, and then based on which infections we think are most likely, we go in uh, and use tests, whether it's an antibody test or a direct detection test like culture, or PCR, or antigen testing, to specifically rule in or rule out that particular infection. Um, that, that can be successful. Obviously, it's, it's um, difficult in cases like this where the potential uh, number of infections is so broad and the and as we know the diagnostic yield for infectious agents in this condition is very poor um, so uh, metagenomic sequencing has a potential advantage here in the sense that it's just instead of going in with probes specific for a particular infectious agent the technique uses millions of random uh, primers that allow you to uh, amplify all the genetic material present in the spinal fluid and then computationally uh, analyze the non-human sequences that you've sequenced um, to see which uh, agents or, or agent that they best match to. And so the potential there is to get surprised. And so um, by, you know, with metagenomic sequencing, there's the ability to identify totally novel agents as was uh, done by the Chinese um, at the beginning of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, they sequenced uh, RNA from a sputum sample of a patient um, and found uh, viral sequences in there that uh, matched to uh, a cousin, what turned out to be a cousin of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so even though it wasn't a perfect match, they were able to say there's a coronavirus here, and then they were able to do further analyses and assemble the genome of this novel virus. Um, so there's a potential to get really surprised again with a, a totally novel pathogen. Um, there's the ability to detect known pathogens that just aren't known to cause uh, the clinical syndrome that the patient is presenting with. Um, there's the ability to detect pathogens that are known to cause um, uh, particular clinical syndrome, but are just so rare that diagnostic testing, conventional testing is not easily available. And then, you know, as another potential uh, benefit for patients with uh, NORS is the ability um, to use metagenomics to feel more confident that there may not be an infection present um, because the test can diagnose um, the whole range of infectious agents from fungi to parasites to RNA or DNA viruses, and, as well as bacteria. If those are not present in a CSF sample, then, uh, then physicians may feel more confident about treating for non-infectious etiologies. So like any diagnostic test, MNGS has some caveats. Um, the first is that um, some neurologic infections like West Nile virus, for example, are transient. And so, uh, meaning that the the virus and its and its nucleic acid is only present for uh, hours to days in the spinal fluid, even though the patient may be sick for much longer. Um, and so, when MNGS is performed on spinal fluid that is obtained uh, late in a patient's illness, then it may detect some infections still quite well, um, but other infections, um, we have less confident that they've been ruled out. Um, again, uh, like West Nile is, is a great example. If, if the CSF is collected a week into the illness or two weeks into the illness, then a negative MNGS result, um, it doesn't have a great negative predictive value for, for ruling out a transient infection like West Nile. Um, similarly, MNGS um, is, it has the advantage of 
broadly looking for infections, um, but it can have some decreased sensitivity for very low level, uh, especially um, viral infections that might be uh, better picked up by, a, by an optimized pathogen specific PCR. Um, and then there are two other caveats less relevant for NORS. Um, one is that uh, compartmentalized infections like an abscess can be uh, less sensitively detected because there's just um, little to none of the organism shed into the spinal fluid. And also patients who have CSF with very high cell counts, like in the thousands or tens of thousands, um, can have decreased sensitivity for detecting uh, non-human sequences in the spinal fluid because there's just so much human genetic material. Um, I, I want to just quickly mention that, um, especially for these transient uh, viral infections, um, because of because they're hard to detect in real time with direct detection testing, we do often um, diagnose these cases with uh, serology, with the antibody testing in CSF. And so we are, uh, on a research basis, also looking at, with a research tool broadly um, for antiviral antibodies in the spinal fluid. We use a tool first developed by Steve Elledge's lab at, at Harvard called uh, Programmable Phage Display, in which we look um, in, in spinal fluid for uh, antibodies um, to um, nearly half a million uh, peptides derived from all vertebrate, tick, and mosquito viruses. So this is a research tool, um, but it can supplement the direct detection testing that we do with sequencing. And the last thing I'll, I'll end with is just that um, when we perform metagenomic sequencing, um, because we're sequencing all the genetic material in the sample, uh, over 95% of the data we generate are actually human uh, sequence data, both uh, DNA sequences as well as RNA sequences. And, and with the RNA sequences, there's an opportunity to analyze the host gene expression data um, that are generated in the setting of, of um, this condition. And so there's an opportunity, whether we detect a pathogen or not, to compare the host expression profiles of Norse patients to patients with uh, clear-cut uh, viral encephalitis, autoimmune encephalitis, et cetera, and to see which profile um, uh, this they best uh, fit with um, and which may help with um, diagnostic classification and may also help with uh, biomarker identification and even um, candidate therapeutic targets. So I'll just end there and, and thank you for your time. And again, I'm sorry, I can't be there with you in, in live. Okay. Thank you to Dr. Wilson for sending that video in for us. Um, our next uh, expert, Commentary is from Dr. Jim Riviello. He's a professor at Baylor. He's a neurointensivist and pediatric neurologist uh, who's been uh, very involved with anything related to status epilepticus and children for uh, many years now. So, uh, Jim, if you could unmute and put on your video, that'd be great. Oh, it's on. All right, no, thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you for uh, having me as part of this symposium. So some of the questions that I was asked to comment on, and uh, at least initially, would be, uh, would we have any difference in seizure management uh, by age, an eight-year-old, a 15-year-old, or as uh, Emily will comment on later, a 60-year-old? And I did say no difference in seizure management uh, when I made the slide, but I have one addition or caveat to that. And that would be that from the anesthetic management, and we have certain intravenous anesthetics that we typically use for refractory status epilepticus, including pentobarbital, ketamine, thiopental, and propofol. Uh, we generally don't use propofol in the pediatric age range because of the concern for what's called the propofol infusion syndrome. And this is a disorder in which uh, patients can get hypotension, particularly and uh, cardiopulmonary compromise uh, when the infusion rate of propofol goes above a certain amount. Uh, and uh, so we don't, we, we have not used that at all 
Uh, so that would be one difference in seizure management. I think when you get to the point of what we call the refractory or then the super refractory status epilepticus cases that uh, we generally use the same, uh, same seizure medications across all ages. Uh, the other question would be that uh, uh, the differences in evaluation and management across ages again, uh, different centers have different protocols. There's not been one particular protocol that has been used uh, across the world or across centers. Although you can see from some of the work that's that's come out of the Delphi, uh, the Delphi approach that there is a, a, a consensus developing about the, the early on treatment for this. Uh, the, uh, the American Epilepsy Society meeting that Dr. Wickstrom referred to, there was also another uh, a meeting over in, in the previous several years in which uh, a, a separate group of people, although some of the same people that are involved in the Delphi group, uh, looked at uh, a, a treatment protocol. And uh, not so surprisingly, because some of the people are uh, very s the same people, that there's a similarity in the approach. Uh, we do recommend that if we're going to use uh, immune modulating therapies early on uh, and then the ketogenic diet or uh, anakinra, which we can get to, that uh, we want to do these things as soon as possible. In our experience here with anakinra, which is a cytokine uh, modulator, uh, we've seen patients who uh, were transferred here after weeks and we used anakinra then, and we believe that the earlier that we start the anakinra, the better. Uh, as far as prognosis, the uh, I took this from a uh, a series that uh, Uri Kramer put together, and uh, uh, what this came from was he contacted the. Uh, the centers that had reported some of the initial patients. And in his paper, there were 77 uh, patients, nine died, and there were 68 survivors. And as you can see from the data here from the slide, that out of the 68 survivors, 66 had epilepsy. And in the, and in the majority of those, uh, the epilepsy was refractory. Refractory meaning that it does not respond to anticonvulsant therapy. So unfortunately, so far with this disorder, we have a, you know, we have an outcome in which if uh, there is survival, that the survival is going to include uh, seizures and cognitive difficulties. From this, uh, from this uh, paper, 18% uh, of the patients were classified as normal, but with or without attention deficit or learning disabilities. 16% uh, were considered borderline, 15% uh, mild mental retardation, 24% moderate mental retardation, 12% uh, uh, severe mental retardation, and 16% were vegetative. And so when we see the, this kind of data, you can understand why people are putting a lot of emphasis in how to better identify and treat this disorder, particularly early on, because of course we would hope that we can uh, we can change uh, these outcomes. Now, there is a latent period uh, in which patients may have a control of their seizures because of the treatments that we've done in the acute phase in the ICU. Uh, so people can be seizure free and then have seizure and then develop seizures later. I've seen, uh, personally, I've seen latency periods uh, that are longer than the three months that I listed here. This came from the literature. Uh, so I've seen longer periods of remission, and especially when we've tried to uh, reduce the anticonvulsant therapy that patients are on. So as we're chronically in the chronic setting, reducing the anticonvulsants, we may see that some of the seizures come back. And of course, during this latent period in ep with epilepsy in general, we're always wondering, is there something that we could be doing 
to disrupt the process of, uh, of epileptogenesis. Uh, clinical tips that I would add from the pediatric point of view would be uh, the younger the age of onset, the greater the need for us to exclude uh, underlying uh, metabolic conditions. Of course, uh, for Norse or fires in general, we're always looking for what's the underlying cause or epilepsy, pediatric or adult epilepsy, what's the underlying cause of the disorder because the seizure medications for the most part will not be controlling the underlying disorder. They may control the seizures, but they're not uh, treating what, uh, what led to the seizure. So we're always looking for that. But particularly in the younger children, we're looking for underlying metabolic diseases. So metabolic diseases are uh, typically genetic or metabolic disorders in which uh, there's a, a buildup of uh, metabolic uh, toxins, if you will, or down, down the metabolic stream, there's a defect in a, uh, a certain metabolic compound that then leads to neurological dysfunction. And in our series of 22 patients with what we called uh, severe refractory status epilepticus, and this we started collecting this data in uh, 1992, so that was before the, the terminology fires was used. We used the term presumed encephalitis because the patients all had the, the pre-existing uh, fever before they presented. Uh, but in this series of 22 patients, three of them had underlying metabolic disorders. And these were all the younger ones, less than 3.5 years of age. So when we're presented with the patients in the ICU, we're doing a large uh, workup to try to uh, identify the underlying cause. And as, as we previously said, as, uh, particularly as far as infection, we want to exclude infection first because uh, excluding inf if a patient has an infection, we may not want to use some of the, some of the uh, other immune modulators. And in this particular case, I might add with given the concern about the mycoplasma, that one of the uh, questions about mycoplasma is what's the mechanism of disease in the brain? Is it a direct infection? Is it an immune response or is it some type of a toxic encephalopathy? So uh, I, I, I might have used uh, IVIG because uh, that's been reported in some series uh, as being helpful. Uh, and again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. Great, thank you very much, Jim. Fantastic, you addressed all the uh, main topics. Um, all right, our next um, speaker is Ingo Helbig. He is uh, at Children's Hospital Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania, and he's a neurogeneticist. Uh, Ingo? Just checking. Can you guys see my screen? Oh, hang on. Let me... Uh... I can. Can everybody else? Nora, can you see? Okay. Yep, you're good. And you and you and you seeing the full screen, right? You have the. Can you uh, make it presentation? Uh, it's in yeah the the other it's the other side. It's present okay. presentation mode. There you go. Perfect. Now. Still small. Too small. Um, it's a split screen. We see you half, and then your oh, your okay, side. Okay, it's just uh, Zoom is just messing up again. Give me one second. Slide. Uh, I no. think that that's that that's worked okay for me. Yeah, yeah, that that's perfect from my viewpoint. Can you guys, point. Point. Can you guys yeah. see the? Yes, full you're screen? fine. That's yeah, good. You're, you're, you're fine. No, no split screen. You can see the full screen, right? Because I'm I'm trying to kind of put this on two screens here. All right, thank you. So I'm a chart neurologist and. Um, in a neurogenetics uh, physician in CHOPS epilepsy neurogenetics um, uh, program. And um, we've done basically um, genetics of fires and, and NORS. And I wanted to maybe start out by telling you what, um, how we typically approach this. So as you know, that there's, there's a kind of quite big gap between what we do in terms of genetics on the adult side and what we do on the pediatric side. And I think on the pediatric side, 
a patient that we would have had in a rapid exome or exome uh, rapid genome. This is kind of the standard in pediatric centers right, uh, right now. Um, however, um, genetics in fires and NORS is often started, but there's often not um, any particular yield. So let me walk you through this a little bit. Um, we, we had seen this from kind of um, Jim earlier that um, we need to kind of think about early cases. So typically when we think about epilepsy genetics, this is often something that affects the pediatric population. This is a systematic review that came out last year that looked at diagnostic yield in epilepsies in general. And the answer is it's 24%, and this is a relatively solid number across hundreds of different studies. The studies that are included vary quite a bit. You can see here this forest plot on the what we call the diagnostic yield. And the genes that we typically find are, are genes that we do not find in fires. This is SCN1A for Dravet syndrome, KCNQ2, which is a neonatal gene, SCN2A. And typically when we kind of identify patients with these genes, they typically don't have a fires presentation. Yes, they can have status epilepticus. PCDH19 is a condition, for example, that can have refractory status epilepticus. The patients never have super refractory fires nor status epilepticus. We looked at um, exome sequencing in fires um, Two, two years ago, and this is kind of a cohort of 50 patients. Um, and the answer is basically zero. So the diagnostic yield, when we look at fires in this case, or NORS, is zero. However, a diagnostic workup is typically performed because often the entire picture isn't always clear. There's always the, uh, the time point where we would like to exclude metabolic disorders, where we would like to exclude hidden mitochondrial disease disorders. So genetic testing is typically performed. So, but our overall expectations for a um, typical fires case, so a patient where we kind of say we can exclude an acute symptomatic event, we can exclude um, a presentation of a very prominent metabolic disorder, our yield is typically very, very low. Um, when we come back to Mr. J, I would like to maybe work through these kind of three different groups on what we would think about and a kind of young adult with regards to potential causes. Again, the scenario is quite different if you look at younger kids. You know, if, if you look at, at, at older patients, there are other situations, but for a young adult, I would suggest thinking of this in three different buckets. I would think of this as potential metabolic causes, potential mitochondrial causes, and potential causes that I would call idiopathic for lack of a better word. So kind of bona fide epilepsy genes. When it comes to metabolism, there are reports of cases such as OTC deficiency that present with status epilepticus. However, this is usually not a Norse pattern. And um, the metabolic abnormalities associated with these kind of conditions are typically so prominent that they would be kind of found in regular testing. Um, when we go to the next bucket, mitochondrial disorders, um, we have to kind of realize that Larry, your patient actually had a multi-system disease. We had reptomyalysis, you know, we had other features, and it's often not clear in the ICU setting, is this a kind of secondary feature of the treatment, or could this be a primary feature of an underlying susceptibility? Yeah. Um, typically, when we have mitochondrial disorders and we have patients who are in status epilepticus for quite a long time, it's important to know that mitochondrial disorders, in this case, are um, disorders of energy deficiency, and they would typically not have longer status epilepticus periods without any prominent brain injury. Yes, Paul G deficiency, for example, is, is the most common um, um, mitochondrial disorder that we would see in this, this setting, can have super refractory seizures, those are often partial seizures, but they typically go along with a very clear stroke-like pattern on the MRI. So it would be very, very atypical for a mitochondrial disease affecting the, the, the brain to have seizures on the one hand, but not have brain injuries on the other hand. And then finally, there's a group of conditions that we would call um, genetic focal epilepsies. When we think about genetic epilepsies, especially in, in, in adults, they come into classes, the generalized epilepsies, where there's typically a generalized EEG pattern or focal epilepsies. And there's a group of conditions that um, we think of as genetic focal epilepsies. Typically, these conditions are seen running in families, but more often than not, in 2022, do we see cases where this is a sporadic epilepsy and we don't have a family history. 
the genes involved are kind of genes um, in the mTOR pathway, so DEPDEC5, MPR3 are kind of genes in this mTOR pathway, and these conditions can present with um, early or first onset of seizures in this setting of status epilepticus. Again, it's quite unlikely. There's not an identified case, but it's theoretically possible that a focal epilepsy due to a genetic cause can present like this. And the reason why this would be important is because these conditions are on the verge of being treated with mTOR inhibitors. So there might be an additional therapeutic avenue if such a genetic cause would be identified. To sum this up quickly, when we think about the genetic causes, they are relatively common in the epilepsies. The younger an epilepsy starts, um, the more likely this is. We have a diagnostic yield of actually more than 50% in neonates, and this kind of decreases over time with maybe a diagnostic yield of 5 to 10% in adult idiopathic epilepsy. It is basically absent in fires and NORS, where we have not found any um, known epilepsy genes. And genetic testing is typically per performed, is increasingly also performed in an adult neurology setting. And I would think of these conditions in this kind of three-part category, excluding mitochondrial diseases, excluding metabolic disorders, and then thinking about the non-lesional epilepsies that may present like this. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ingo. Um, so as we are gonna be a little short on time for the big discussion, I encourage uh, all our speakers to continue answering the questions in the chat and people who have more, uh, feel free to keep submitting them. And we have tons of world experts uh, attending here who and answering some of them as well. So thank you for that and keep the questions going in the chat. Um, so our next speaker will be Emily Gilmore. So she is the, uh, she is an adult neurointensivist and ICU eeg -er at Yale with me, and uh, she co-runs our continuous EEG monitoring program. And so we asked her to speak from the neurointensivist viewpoint. Emily, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Larry, uh, in order for the invitation. Um, you know, I was asked, similar to Jim, to really focus on the other end of the age spectrum. And so I think you know, in the context of this particular patient presenting with a low-grade fever and headache and photophobia, it certainly takes you down uh, an infectious pathway, um, you know, but to avoid anchoring bias, I think one needs to really step back and take an exhaustive medical history, you know, um, ask the family about subacute cognitive or personality changes, whether there are other risk factors that might predispose the patient to malignancy like smoking, um, whether there are clinical characteristics like unintentional weight loss or B-type symptoms that, that might point to that. Um, in addition, to get at some of the metabolic and genetics conditions that can present later in life, taking an exhaustive family history, really understanding whether there are metabolic or mitochondrial diseases or even autoimmune diseases uh, that run in the family um, and, and will point you towards uh, working up a more well-defined syndrome or uh, help you understand what factors might be confounding things. In this case, mycoplasma was identified fairly early and, and had this been an older patient, I still think we would have probably gone down a more extensive workup just because of the other risk factors uh, associated with that age um, group. And so, you know, the question that was alluded to also is, is this direct invasion of mycoplasma or an autoimmune reaction, or is it just coincidentally diagnosed in the workup? Um, and that's where uh, the, the work that Mike Bolson presented in metagenomics can be helpful, uh, but, you know, it's really restricted to the time frame with which those results can be resulted in, um, to allow for uh, urgent decision making. After infectious causes are evaluated, some of which might be dictated by the time of year or geographical region, um, you know, you then need to think about the autoimmune reaction or parainfectious causes, or even a superimposed autoimmune encephalitis or perineoplastic cause, particularly in older folks. And this is because a significant number of folks who present with uh, what's now, you know, deemed fires can have an underlying autoimmune uh, encephalitis or perineoplastic encephalitis, or even a concomitant viral infection, um, as well as the genetic and metabolic causes we talked about. And so it's important when diagnostically working them up to uh, save extra CSF for additional studies, consider a repeat uh, LP within the first week, and uh, definitely before um, immunomodulatory therapy that's IgG depleting um, is initiated. 
Um, I think if uh, it's also helpful to consider sending cytokines to see what the inflammatory profile is and to do an exhaustive rheumatologic um, workup in combination with that. And the, the autoimmune and perineoplastic workup should include you know, the panels that are available and really expand the whole spectrum for intracellular synaptic and ion channel as well as cell surface antibodies. This patient had an MRI brain, which I assume from an imaging standpoint was done with contrast, but um, if, if the cause isn't elicited or the patient's not getting better, repeat imaging, you know, at the, around the first week, um, it should be considered along with complete imaging of the neuroaxis to see if um, there's other additional foci of, uh, of um, uh, inflammation um, within the, the spinal cord or other parts of the brain. If there is a targetable lesion in the brain um, and that's potentially where the seizures are coming from, where it enhances and it might be diagnostically useful, certainly a brain biopsy can be considered. And I alluded to the, the fact that this patient's age puts him in a, in a category in which an oncologic workup would be warranted, particularly with regards to thinking about the perineoplastic encephalitis. And so a PAN scan, perhaps, you know, a testicular ultrasound, um, whole body PET, right? These are some of the things that, that get discussed as we're thinking about the, the um, etiology. Um, genetic testing was mentioned, which seems more relevant to the younger populations, although there are some genetic or mitochondrial and metabolic conditions that can present later in life and might need to be considered. We've certainly included muscle biopsies in our, you know, as, in our diagnostic workup as we've moved forward. So that really, you know, addresses kind of the diagnostic thoughts about the age category. With regards to the therapeutics, you know, I think um, as uh, Jim also alluded to, it's fairly similar in, in children and adults, with the exception of the propofol, um, you know, exemption that we often consider in, in pediatric patients. I think in this particular patient, I probably would have gone to ketamine before going to pentobarb. And I think it's always challenging because pentobarb can in and of itself cause a lactic acidosis and, and septic shock-like picture. Um, but you know, the Pris syndrome that, that Larry mentioned it, it is real. We've seen it in a couple cases and it can be quite concerning. So those um, markers have to be watched real, really closely. I think it's also important to realize that in older uh, folks who have a history of CHF, ketamine can actually, which is known to induce hypertension and, and offset the anesthetic effect, can actually um, induce hypotension in patients who have underlying CHF. And so just something to be aware of. And although eight years ago, we weren't commonly using anti-seizure medications like berberacetam, parampanil, pregabalin, you know, vigabatrin, oxcarb, those would have been some other drugs to potentially consider, particularly as we were weaning off anesthetics. I might have also tried phenobarbital in that first wean before, before um, putting the patient back on an anesthetic. Um, and then Finally, just to touch on a few other things, in cryptogenic norse without features of known autoimmune encephal um, encephalitis syndromes, right, some of the classic presentations, I think considering IL-1, so anakinra or IL-6, um, you know, are, are warranted. Um, we, we tend to favor anakinra just because of some of the side effects associated with TOSI, uh, particularly the pancreatitis and bowel perforation, which we seem to be more prevalent. And then, you know, if you're going to initiate that that treatment, um, considering a cytokine panel to as assess uh, response to treatment. Um, and then uh, moving on with the immunomodulatory therapy, once you've you know, in instituted steroids, if the patient's still not um, having a response or worsening, and you haven't identified a, a clear cause that you think is definitively the etiology, certainly considering uh, in a second line immuno uh, immunotherapy, whether that be um, PLEX or IVIG, uh, and, and that should be dictated by what you think the most likely etiology is. If a pathologic antibody is detected or suspected, right, then um, perhaps rituximab should be considered earlier in the course. I think other therapeutic um, you know, interventions can ketogenic diet. Some folks have done ECT, TMS. And if there is a clear foci of where the seizures are coming from, even resection has been considered in case reports. With regards to outcome in this particular age group, you know, kids are much more resilient to have much more plasticity and reserve for, I think, tolerating this, assuming they don't have disem, you know, ADEM type picture with, with irreversible injury. But, but uh, with regards to adults, right, age, comorbidities, the etiology, disease severity, including both the presumed primary and secondary seizure related you know, secondary meaning seizure-related injury on MRI, right? So in this particular case, the brain looked actually pretty good. It was really only changes um, in the hippocampus that were thought to be related to, to seizures. 
uh, the response to treatment, the tolerance of treatment, right? Younger people can often tolerate shock and multi-organ failure better than older folks and overall values and wishes. Um, I think once seizure control is, a, is achieved um, and the patient's stabilized, then it's really just becomes a bit of a, a waiting game, recognizing that um, being realistic with the family about the long road to recovery, the, the likely deficits that will result with regards to cognitive issues and perhaps even spasticity and epilepsy that, that Jim spoke about even in the pediatric population. Um, some clinical tips I think I would highlight are just avoiding overt nihilism, giving up too early. We've certainly seen people do well. Uh, we, we tend to talk about the 30 the 30% 30 rule, which is, you know, so comes from the, the Kramer study, but 30% of patients will die, 30% will be, you know, severely impacted by this in a, in, um, and have functional disability, and 30% will actually do pretty well. Right. And so we try to couch the family with regards to that prognosis and look at some of the individualized features of the case to really drive a more precise prognostication within the limits uh, of where we're at in the field. Um, and I think the final piece is just having multidisciplinary conferences, engaging your neuroimmunology team, your epilepsy team, your neurocritical care team, you know, um, to really uh, utilize all the resources within your institution to support the care of the patients and, and don't hesitate to reach out um, to experts in the in the field, even if they're not at your institution, to, to get help with regards to diagnostic um, and therapeutic approaches. So. Thank you, Emily. Fantastic tips. Um, all right, we're going to give the last word to Ayal Mascal, who is the Chief of Rheumatology at Texas Children's at Baylor. So, Ayal, take it away. Thank you. And I don't have slides either, as I knew that by the end, uh, people would probably touch upon most everything. And I didn't want to be redundant. I, I think the most important point is actually my acknowledgement to Nora and Larry and Ronnie, that in terms of being inclusive and understanding, even before the pandemic, that the only way you can take care of rare diseases with catastrophic outcomes is to bring teams together. And in certain institutions, that team on the pediatric side needs to have um, physicians that are comfortable with precision medicine and are comfortable with targeted therapies. And that is in some places neuroimmunologists, in other places um, it's rheumatologists. So I really appreciate the opportunity to work closely with neurologists. I do that every day with Dr. Riviello and, uh, and all the neurology colleagues here at Texas Children's. I think some of the questions in the chat really bring um, the points that Larry wanted me to touch upon to the forefront. And that is, uh, as Ronnie mentioned beautifully, that we are looking to get to targeted therapies earlier while we're actually building the plane in mid-flight. And, and this is not new to rare disease medicine. I think um, COVID hyperinflammation and on the pediatric side, the multi-system inflammatory condition allowed us to do that, or at least challenge us to do that every single day. And as Dr. Gilmore said, that is in bringing teams together at the bedside, whether they're local, national, or international. So the first piece is, uh, I think one of the questions in the chat, um, though cytokines have been discussed in the literature, there was a nice paper from uh, Russell Dale and team in Sydney, uh, in fires showing that there's probably a TH1 response, as you'd expect after maybe a, a, a viral infection, you have an inappropriate immune response that's often driven by interferon gamma. Many of those uh, cytokines though are not commercially available. So the issue is, are these questions merely research grade or can we get to them commercially? Um, you know, the, the initial Anakinner case report that looked um, from the Mayo Clinic uh, probably had a kid that that had an interleukin-1 uh, deficiency. And so, you know, fires in Norse are obviously not just one uh, etiology. And you have to be really careful in terms of when you get cytokines, is that pre-therapy, is that after steroids, is that in the CSF or serum? Many of us inherit patients at our institutions that have already been somewhere else uh, for therapy. There are also circadian rhythms and there's lots of issues um, that were mentioned in the chat regarding how do you interpret slightly high um, cytokine levels. And I think all of that will need to be studied in comparative effective studies that truly have biologic correlates, as I think our pediatric cancer physicians do all the time in terms of always having a biologic questions as they deal with new therapies. Um, 
I think animal models have sort of discussed, shown us that um, there's an inflammasome response, uh, perhaps one uh, that anakinra can help. Anakinra does cross the blood-brain barrier somewhat, um, and it actually is sort of a, a mimic of an endogenous uh, interleukin-1 uh, receptor agonist, uh, and perhaps getting even a little bit in the brain seems to help us. Um, some of the commercial panels and the, the cytokine studies out there also look at some downstream cytokines such as IL-6 or IL-8, whether that allows us to target uh, the interleukin-6 interleukin system with tocilizumab, I think is still something we have to figure out. And Dr. Gilmore sort of mentioned there are some complexities in terms of using uh, IL-6 blockade when you have liver dysfunction or potentially GI issues, and many of our patients have those. Um, Larry had asked me to talk about targeted therapies, and indeed, as our kind of speakers mentioned before, this is really driven by um, bringing teams together that have seen clinical phenotypes. Uh, and if it looks like your presentation before was not just about seizures, but had uh, in a child, because I only take care of children, I uh, had subacute cognitive issues or behavioral, uh, especially if there were movement disorders, uh, that's much more of an autoimmune encephalitis and kind of NMDA story. And for that sort of patient, uh, if you're still having issues, you're going to go down a, a B cell driven approach with rituximab. There are some complexities here as there are a few papers that there's innate immune dysfunction also in autoimmune encephalitis. And as we all know, uh, for any of the immunologists or neuroimmunologists uh, uh, on today's um, seminar, the immune system is not compartmentalized. Um, now, Larry also wanted me to kind of talk about some practical uh, tools. Um, so I talked about rituximab. I think anakinra um, is readily available in many pediatric hospitals. It's not readily available in adult institutions, uh, as obviously still's disease is less common in adults, and it's not a medication that's often used. Um, COVID has changed that a little bit. There have been some clinical trials. <clears throat> the use um, the use of anakinra and COVID, but I think it's often a drug that's difficult to get in adult hospitals. It is easy to use. Uh, you can use it IV. The half-life is very short at six hours. It can penetrate the CNS. If you have any infections, you can actually hold it. That is much more difficult. Rituximab, obviously you deplete B cells very quickly. Uh, and tocilizumab kind of to a similar degree has a half-life of at least two weeks. And obviously, if you have infections or you generate infections during tocilizumab, you are wide open to those issues. And I think we still have to learn. There's some case series that are coming about in terms of the use of tocilizumab uh, and whether that you would use after anakinra or whether with focused cytokines. Um, and lastly, I don't think age makes a huge difference here, though I only take care of children. Uh, I think um, the phenotype infections and other organ dysfunction probably are much more important in how you utilize a targeted therapy. Uh, and as I said, I think the most important thing is that we bring teams together, um, starting at the bedside, uh, but also in terms of clinical care and research. Um, I think some of the important issues, we don't have point of care diagnostics. Uh, even commercial cytokine panels may take five to seven days to come back. Uh, and we have to sort of work really harder with our scientists and entrepreneurs to get us at point of care kits uh, as we try to break down silos. Uh, and I think uh, I appreciate everybody's time and the invitation to sort of talk about these elements. Fantastic. Thank you, Ayal. And thank you to all our expert commentators. And uh, we'll continue the discussion in the chat as has been going on. Um, all right, we're going to uh, move on. We're about 10 minutes behind our planned schedule. Um, so next we have um, maybe our most important presentation. It's going to be a, a family message. We have uh, two mothers who have lost their children to Norse and uh, have been very graciously been willing to speak to us here. I mean, for us, this is our job and we speak frequently on Zoom meetings and things, but um, uh, for them to come talk about something obviously this personal important to them, uh, to a large group of uh, researchers, um, we're just greatly appreciative. Um, so we have uh, Sarah, who's Finn's mom, and Judith, who's Gabe's mom. 
And I believe Judith is going to go first. So Judith, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. My name is Jude Weiss. My son Gabe became suddenly ill in July 2017 when he was two and a half and was diagnosed with fires. Although he survived the acute phase after seven weeks in the ICU and three months in rehab, and he made significant progress in his recovery, he was never the same. We had the new Gabe for a little over two years until he eventually went back into status and passed away in February, 2020, when he was five years old. I would like to talk with you about communication. When Gabe was in the acute phase that July in super refractory status epilepticus, and the word fires first appeared in our conversations, we had no idea what we were up against. In fact, we were filling out paperwork for Gabe to attend a Montessori school that August and expecting our family vacation to Cape Cod in September to take place as planned. It wasn't until an ICU attending who happened to be working her last few shifts before leaving for a new job said to us, you should be prepared that Gabe might not know you when he wakes up, that we began to realize the scope of what was actually happening. Before his coma, still lucid enough between seizures to be his playful, if precocious and extremely verbal self, he knew every nurse, every fellow, every EEG tech in the PICU by name. Thanks to this doctor, we were given a hint of what was to come, that he might not know us. I would urge clinicians to practice very clear and very direct communication with parents. With so much unknown about Norse and fires, I can understand and appreciate the reluctance to tell the truth about what is known and the need to maintain some kind of hope in the face of this unknown. But please be real with us. Tell us the truth. Tell us what you do know. We might not want to know, but we need to know. We might get angry. We might cry, but we still need to know. Trying, trying to protect us from the reality is not helpful. The last few days of Gabe's life were wrought with tough conversations. Another trusted attending we'd grown to know over the two years Gabe was in and out of this hospital said to us, this sucks. It was blunt, it was direct, and it was true. He went on to say, the teams, acute care and neuro, have all talked and come up with three options. All of the options are terrible. Finally, during your visit from Gabe's regular pediatrician, the picture was becoming more and more bleak. And he said to us, there are some things worse than death. It was at that point we realized that we wanted to involve the pediatric palliative care team and we initiated that consult. This honesty and frankness empowered us to help our son in a situation that had felt utterly hopeless and out of control. And we'll always be grateful for that. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who will talk a little bit more about ways you can help to empower parents and confirm their feelings. Thanks, Jude. Um, I'm Sarah Mossetter and Finn's mom. Uh, my son became suddenly very sick with fires in June 2016, uh, when he was five and a half years old. After about two weeks in a coma in the PICU, he passed away. Uh, Jude talked to you about the importance of candid communication. I would like to talk to you about how that communication empowers parents. As Finn's days in the ICU wore on, one of the attendings pulled us aside into an empty ICU room. She laid out the extent of the damage done to his brain, explained what that meant, described the challenges he would face if he were to survive, how a typical day for him would look. She asked us what our views were for Finn's quality of life. She cautioned that there would be difficult choices to be made in the coming days, and we should use this to guide us. As a parent, you are never ready to have that conversation but it gave us the ability to help our son and make the best choices for him in his final days. Empowering us in this way was a gift. Give that gift to your families. Ask them to define for themselves 
their views on quality of life, empower them, and then reinforce them. I can't tell you how many times over the last six years I have replayed the words of one of our doctors. After we made impossible decision after impossible decision in which we couldn't help but question ourselves, she reminded us, you did absolutely everything you could for Finn and more. And if you ever question that, whether that be in three days, three months, three years, or ever, call me and I will remind you. These words continue to bring such comfort and healing. What a gift to not only be empowered to make the best choice for our son, but then to have that choice confirmed and reinforced in such a meaningful way. Finn's last gift to this world was that he became an organ donor. For us, it fit who he was, his huge heart and giving spirit. Organ donation was something we brought up and asked about in his final days. The process wasn't easy, but it was important to us, so we sought it out. I know in talking to Jude that her Gabe was also an organ donor and they initiated the process as well. We have wondered why no one mentioned it as an option, uh, why we had to initiate it. The best we could come up with was that our care team could see that we were losing everything and couldn't bring themselves to ask anything of us. But I want you to know the comfort and purpose that his donation brought to us. In those final excruciating moments, it was a tiny glimmer of hope, something to grasp onto while our world came crashing down. We thought maybe in our loss, we could help Finn help someone else. Years later, it continues to give us comfort. It is something we are proud of, something positive that came out of pain and loss. For us, it was the right thing to do. It won't be for everyone. But I encourage you to allow your families to decide if they wish to consider organ donation and donations to science, such as the Norse Fires Biorepository at Yale. Communicate, empower them, reinforce them. They will never forget it or you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to uh, both of you for sharing Finn's story and Gabe's story. Um, it's not only was that great advice for our clinicians, but it's also, this is the, these are the things that keep us motivated to do better, make advances. Um, and for the researchers, it's great. This is the, exactly the kind of thing we need to hear and are working on to prevent. Um, so thank you again for sharing. Um, all right, so our next speaker uh, has the uh, tough job of trying to follow that up. Uh, it's Dr. Raquel Farias Muller is gonna talk about communicating about Norse on social media, and then we'll have our uh, break after that. Um, so wait, let me share the slides. Uh, the one, one thing I did not do is give you the outcome uh, from, hold on, my, um, can you guys still hear? You're breaking up a little, but we can hear you. Um, I'm getting warnings from Zoom, something about Zoom. Yeah, your connection seems a little shaky. In my back? <laughs> yes, you are back now. Okay, uh, I got kicked out of Zoom. All right, um, I assume I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Sorry about that. 
Yeah. How about now? Looks good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you the outcome in the case that I, I presented. So it's a very unusual outcome in how unbelievably well he did. Um, so status was controlled after 33 days. Uh, he spent more than two months in the neuro ICU, six weeks in inpatient rehab. And he actually got back to completely normal cognition. Um, and he later applied to graduate schools, got in, uh, got a master's degree, and is now working. His, his main disability is related to his spinal cord problem from the mycoplasma. Um, he recently got married and expecting his first child very soon. Uh, he still has refractory epilepsy, but relatively mild, does not have a big effect on his quality of life, though he's still on three meds and has occasional seizures. Um, so that was the outcome in that case. Okay, so getting on to Dr. Farias Muller's presentation. Uh, Raquel, why don't you take it away and just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Sure thing. Uh, thank you so much. And I um, want to especially thank Jude and Sarah for their really powerful talks. Uh, I feel incredibly humbled to follow uh, them. I will briefly um, talk about social media as a form of communication for patients and family members uh, with NORS. Next slide, please. Uh, we all know that social media platforms are a novel way for people to connect regardless of their physical location. Um, and this form of communication and socializing is very important, especially when we're dealing with um, individuals who have barriers to connect in person. And these may be geographic, physical, economic, medical. And in the past uh, couple of years, um, uh, pandemic related. Uh, so we've all experienced uh, needing to connect in different ways uh, in light of the pandemic. Um, families and individuals who deal with very rare diseases are very active participants in social media groups, and they use, utilize it for very many purposes, and these may include socializing with people who have the same disability as uh, you may, or as your child uh, may have. Um, they gravitate towards social media platforms to seek medical advice, to seek medical professionals who may help them, who, to seek specialists. Uh, and they also see, uh, re, uh, gravitate towards these platforms to um, uh, be um, aware of research endeavors and uh, research uh, uh, topics that may be coming about uh, in terms of their specific condition. Uh, now, of course, uh, social media, we all know, can be a forum to spread misinformation. Um, and this information that is uh, presented in social media requires significant administration oversight in order to prevent this from happening. Next slide, please. Uh, we've done a little bit of research uh, investigating a social media group that uh, deals with uh, NORS and fires. Uh, we had a, pre uh, a paper published in Epilepsy Open last year uh, that aimed to investigate uh, how parents perceived fires, apologize for that typo, fires outcomes, uh, assess the family members' emotional states, and um, study a little bit about uh, social media usage in this particular group. We did a survey analysis of parents of children's, children who had fires and they participated in this fires uh, Facebook group. We collected this information on the uh, medical aspects of the children, their co the parents' coping strategies, um, as well as their social media usage. We had 29 surveys that we analyzed. And um, of course, this, uh, you know, this is a little bit biased because these families gravitate towards the social media group, remain in the social media group. So um, we have to take that into account when uh, analyzing these results. But the parents uh, found the social media helpful with coping and 96% desired that fires research be advertised in social media. Um, they shared really valuable recommendations to fellow parents as well as to medical teams. So in conclusion, uh, social media may serve as an introductory platform to enhance the physician, scientist, parent, patient relationship. Next slide, please. Just want to give a, a, a shout out to this FIRES uh, social media group that has uh, um, uh, allowed us to uh, advertise our research uh, in the group. Uh, this is a parent proctored private Facebook group that was started in 2012 by a parent of a child who had fires. 
And the mission of the group was to connect family members dealing with this rare disease. And I'm um, uh, very grateful that I was uh, admitted into the group and was able to advertise some of the research that we're doing in this group. Uh, so I wanna um, thank, thank the, the group members for that. Um, next slide, please. Based on this uh, study, uh, we decided to revamp our social media presence in the Norse Institute. Uh, wanted to advertise our fires, uh, Norse Fires Facebook group um, as an uh, ancillary uh, group that uh, has a couple of uh, important objectives. Next slide, please. We want to raise awareness of Norse and fires uh, as its subcategory. We want to advertise the Norse Institute as a resource for families, patients, and clinicians. And lastly, we want to create a forum for socialization and meaningful connection that is scientifically accurate as well as supportive to families and, and patients who are experiencing, experiencing this condition. Um, next slide, please. We also want to give a shout out to our Twitter account, um, which shares the same mission. Uh, so we are now live on Twitter and Facebook. And um, lastly, we uh, want to thank, uh, next slide please, we want to thank the social media team um, as listed here for helping us revamp our social media presence. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so we are running, running behind. I think we're going to take a, we'll take a five minute break instead of 10. Um, we'll still be a little bit behind. So let's come back at uh, it's 11.43 Eastern time. So I'll see you in five minutes.
If you want, I can share directly my screen. Oh, you want to use your own share on your own? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Do you see the slide? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, don't start. Don't start yet, though. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. We'll start in like ninety seconds. Or so we'll only be eight minutes behind. Then. Okay, we'll give people one extra minute. It's eleven forty-three now. That's okay. It, it was a very short break, so. Okay, so uh, welcome back, everyone. We're going to move on to our data blitz presentation. Uh, we have two uh, two full presentations, and then one short. Uh, hot off the press presentation. Um, so we're going to start with a presentation on immune dysregulation in Norse fires. This is by Okreli Hana from, she's now a postdoctoral researcher at Yale and Dr. Heffler's lab. Um, and she's also has a faculty job waiting for her after that back at the Salpetriere in Paris. Um, and she's been a fantastic collaborator with us and is going to present some new data, so take it away. Yeah, so thank you all and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my first uh, result of my postdoctoral project. So the aim of my project um, aims to investigate the human dysregulation in patients with Northern Fire Syndromes, and especially to answer to the two following question. Are North and Fire syndromes immune disorders characterized by a specific cytokine profile? And could the North onset and status consequences be explained by a change in brain parenchyma and horsia subsets? To answer to the first question, we have begun in Paris in 2019 the measurement of a panel of cytokine by using the complex human cytokine panel from Cronterix. With this method, we are able to look at 10 targeted cytokines, uh, both in serum and CSF samples, with a very high sensitivity because we detect samples to 10 femtograms per milliliter. With this method, we are able to follow patients over time and detect very little differences, uh, but also significant in some cytokines. Nevertheless, this method has also two uh, major pitfalls. Firstly, it requires 40 samples to run a plate, and therefore results can only be provided after several weeks or months uh, for some patients. And it's also an expensive method because each plate costs around $2,000 for 40 patients. And the plate can only be read on an SPX reader that costs $80,000 and is not only available in every laboratory. Therefore, currently, we only use this method for research purposes. But we have decided uh, to run a new panel of cytokine at the Yale School of Medicine by using cytometric bead array. With this method, we are also able to look at targeted cytokines that have to be chosen among a panel of 30 cytokines. For our further experiment, we have decided to focus on the 14 cytokines listed below. 
and we can detect them in plasma and CSF samples with the good sensitivity. With this method, each sample can be analyzed separately, and we are therefore able to uh, send back results within days to requested centers. It's an affordable method that costs around $500 for 40 patients and 14 cytokines. And the plate can be read in every cytometer, like the Fortessa reader that is available at here. We can so use this method for research, but also for clinical purposes. Today, I would like to present to you the first result we got in Paris for patients with cryptogenic northern fires, patients with other refractory status epilepticus of non etiology and patient with autoimmune encephalitis with epilepsy, but without status epilepticus. So we have first uh, measured the 12 cytokines in CFF samples. And in accordance with previous publication, we have observed a significant increase of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, either in North patient in blue or refractory status epilepticus patient in green, when compared to patients without status epilepticus in red. We have also found a significant increase of the CSF IL-1 beta in North patient when compared to the other refractory status epilepticus patients and a trend for the IL-17A. We have performed the same analysis in serum samples, but we were not able to find any differences between the North and refractory status epilepticus patients, while the IL-17A was also higher in North patient when compared to other autoimmune encephalitis patients like for IL-10. We wondered if this absence of difference between North and refractory status epilepticus patient can be explained by the high heterogeneity we can note in serum levels. We have looked at two potential co-founders, the delay between the status onset and sample collection, and the previous use of immunotherapy. The mean delay between the status onset and serum collection was of 21 days in our cohort, and the mean delay between status onset and CSF collection was of 24 days. But we did not find any significant correlation between the status duration and the cytokine levels by Spearman analysis. Around a half of our patients were also already treated by therapy before sample collection but we didn't find difference regardless of immunotherapy. We were able to follow up four patients during several days after the status epilepticus hand, and we have observed the progressive normalization of whole pro-inflammatory cytokines, like IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-8, or IL-17A, in the days that follow the, the hand of the status epilepticus. The next step for this project will be to measure the panel of the 14 cytokines by cytometric bead array in Dr. Heffler lab at the Yale School of Medicine. Measurement will be done in a retrospective database from Paris and prospectively for requested centers. As discussed before, we would like also to be able to correlate the cytokine results to clinical data, treatment use, patient outcome, and disease evolution over time. The second project aims to investigate if the North onset and status consequences can be explained by a change in brain parenchyma and health CSF cells. For this project, we have used 50 mg of French frozen postmortem tissues of frontal and temporal cortex collected in a cryptogenic nurse patient who died nine days after the status epilepticus onset and in a controlled patient who died after an acute respiratory distress syndrome but we did not present any neurological or psychiatric diseases. We have first isolated the total brain nuclei, and then we have performed single nuclear serena sequencing by using the Tenix genomic chromium instrument. The libraries were sequenced by Illumina Novasec 6000 and aligned to a human reference genomes, and data were compared for the nurse and control patients in both areas. So if we first look at this uh, UMAP representation, where the total nuclei of the control patient were represented in gray and the total nuclei of the North patient are represented in red, we can see that we don't have a um, similar representation and distribution of all the nuclei. The first step of our analysis consisted to isolate the different cell clusters. 
In the temporal cortex, we have identified 12 different cell clusters. The cluster zero was underrepresented in the nurse patient, while other clusters like cluster two or cluster five were overrepresented in the nurse patient. The second step of the analysis aimed to label each cell clusters. And for this, we have looked at very specific genes, like green one that is able to um, distinguish neurons, SLC17A7 to identify excitatory neurons, GAD1 for GABAergic neurons, Aquaporin4 for astrocytes, IGAM for microglia, PLP1 for the oligodendrocytes, PDGFRA for the precursor of oligodendrocytes, CLNDN5 for endothelial cells, and TRIC for human cells. With these nine genes, we were able to label the 12 cell clusters, and we found that some populations were presented in several clusters, like the excitatory neurons or the abiotic neurons. We have gathered the cell population to reduce the number of population to eight. As you can see on this graph, we have a cluster of brain resident human cells almost exclusively present in the nurse patient. We have tried to categorize these clusters and we found that there were four different subclusters in this um, temporal cortex. When we look at the different uh, genes, we found that almost all the nuclei present CD8 markers and therefore, it seems to be a mostly a brain resident TCD8 cluster with maybe a little part of CD4 naive cells with IL7 receptor staining. So, we have done the same analysis for the frontal cortex. And if we look at the distribution of the different cell types in temporal cortex at the left and frontal cortex on the right, we can see that we have an increased proportion of microglia and astrocytes in the nurse patient in both cortex. This could be related to the status epilepticus consequences and also explain the status epilepticus persistence. We have also found an increase of the excitatory GABAergic neuron ratio in both cortex. And this could also explain why status epilepticus persists over time or why we can have um, the development of spontaneous seizure after studies. We have found a cluster of brain resident TCD8 cells in the nurse patients that represent around 3% of the total brain nuclei when compared to less than 0.5% for the control patients. The next step for this project will be to realize a new single nuclear serena sequencing for a second nurse patient and also to perform single cell transcriptomic analysis on PBMC and CSF collected at the acute phase of the status epilepticus. We will act now to compare data to source obtained and for other refractory status epilepticus or LC donors. If we find the same profile for nurse patient and other refractory status epilepticus patients, we might conclude that cell proportion disturbances are only related to status epilepticus consequences. Otherwise, if we found a different profile for this two group of patients, we might have a profile signature for those patients. I would like to hand back thank all people involved in this project. So at the Yale School of Medicine, David Hafler, Lee Sanks, uh, Larry, and uh, Nicolas Gaspar for his help on patient selection. And in Paris, Vincent Navarro, Sophie de Meret, and Isabelle Pru for providing us the postmortem tissue. And this project was funded also by the Paratonnerre Association, l'Institut Servier and Philippe Foundation, and received support from the North Institute and Foundation de la PHP for the different experiments conducted. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That's spectacular work. Um, there's some questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see them and want to yes. address them. will be faster than me reading them to you, I think. Um, if somebody wants to raise their hand, we have we have four minutes for questions. So, yeah. So yeah, the first question was uh, was HIL six included in the cytokine panel? So yes, we have uh, included the HIL six. Uh, the cytokine is easy to detect because the level can also be uh, detected by normal kits. So yes, it's a cytokine included. Uh, how much sample volume of serum and CSF is required to run the cytometric bid array? 
for normal kits, we just uh, use a 12.5 microliter of serum or CSF. And for enhanced sensitivity kits that we need to use uh, for IL-1 beta or IL-17A, uh, it requires 50 microliter. Um, we don't have any patients that was previously managed by anakinra or tocilizumab, so I, I was not able to look at this data. Uh, yes, whole of a patient where uh, the samples were collecting during status epilepticons. And we just tried uh, to be at the earliest time uh, possible, but yeah. Yes, I have already read papers that have shown the TH1 signatures uh, in fires and sometimes in nurse patients. Uh, in our court, we were not able to see any gamma uh, secretion differences between the nurse and other refractory status epilepticus patients. But maybe by increasing the number of patients, we were able to we will be able to see it. And concerning the TH17 signature. Um, I think it's it's really new. I don't have seen a lot of papers that reported an increase of the IL-17A uh, in nurse of fires patient. I don't know if other people have seen it. And I don't know if it can be managed by ketogenic diets, uh, but there is also some treatments that targeted directly IL-17A uh, like tocilizumab for IL-6. Okay, great. Uh, Anna Maria Vazani raised her hand. I'll make a comment. Uh, yeah. Question about the data that you showed on the ratio versus populations so when you compare nurse patients with the control. So um, I understand the increase in the fraction of glial cells because these are cells that can proliferate. So you have an increased proportion, if I well understand, because they proliferate in the nurse patients as compared to the control. How do you explain uh, the increased ratio between excitatory and inhibitory neurons in these patients? Uh, it's a really great question. Uh, currently, we did not uh, explain it at all. Maybe it can be uh, related, uh, it can be a cause of the status epilepticus onset, and maybe we can have a different uh, distribution of these two types of neurons in those patients, and it can be the cause of the status. But I think that we will need to reproduce data in the second patient just to be able to have a large um, vision of, of this result and can be concluded more easily on this. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, all right. As you can tell, we're going to hear lots more results from O'Reilly's work in the coming months and years. Um, all right. Our next. Uh, speaker. Uh, it's on neuropathology. It's by Eleanor Aronica, who's a professor of neuroscience and pathology in Amsterdam, um, and Anita Hutner, who's the chief of neuropathology at Yale. And I believe, Eleanor, you're going to share uh, your screen. Uh, you have to allow me to share the screen. Uh, yeah. Now I have. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you, Larry. It's uh, really a great uh, pleasure to participate to this uh, symposium. And uh, in our uh, presentation prepared together with uh, Anita, Anita Utner from uh, Yale University, we will now focus on uh, neuropathology in NORS. Uh, we will briefly address the current knowledge and uh, uh, ongoing research efforts. So what we know, uh, what we would like to achieve uh, I would like to start uh, uh, really briefly defining uh, the problem uh, and uh, the relevance of the problem dealing with rare but devastating condition, really to highlight the value of the use of human brain tissue specimens uh, to generate, uh, validate uh, eventually new hypotheses or mechanisms, a target of therapy, uh, particularly if we have the possibility, and we hope in the near future, uh, to use uh, clinically and neuropathologically well-characterized uh, tissue uh, collected with proper protocols. And uh, Anita will uh, briefly uh, introduce which protocol that will be uh, implemented within uh, uh, the biodepository ATL. And Larry will talk about uh, these uh, discussing opportunity and challenge. 
So we know that North is a rare but devastating uh, uh, condition. According to the definition given in 2018, fires uh, can be considered a subset of, of North. Independently from the age, uh, etiology remains unexplained in about half percent, half of the cases. So we are confronted with this uh, cryptogenic North. And as we already discussed uh, today, we are uh, confronted with a challenging, delicate clinical situation in the communication between physician, patient, patient family, uh, particularly in the unfortunate case of a death where the physician uh, asked the family uh, for permission for post-mortem examination for autopsy, which include uh, also the neuropathological evaluation. And we just hear uh, with Ronnie about the challenge of uh, uh, three to northern fires. And this is not a surprise because we are dealing with uh, a complex dysfunction at the level of network. So a network with different components which can be regulated at the level of DNA, RNA, uh, but also the level of the protein, which may interact each other in different way in each patient. So this may influence the uh, long-term outcome and thinking about the patients which are long-term survivors with comorbidity. So uh, as we just uh, hear from uh, um, the previous talk, uh, we are confronted with an heterogeneous uh, clinically challenging presentation, and uh, uh, we need a really extensive diagnostic workout. And in this uh, uh, diagnostic uh, process, uh, in some cases, brain biopsy is uh, performed. So we have surgical material that can be used also for research. But what we know about uh, the neuropathology in NORS, uh, recently, uh, Jörg Cespede uh, is collecting all these reports uh, based uh, on uh, uh, surgical, but particularly autoptic uh, tissue, uh, preparing a systematic review. Uh, one of the first reports actually dates 1983 from Cornelis Bruton, a uh, highlight in a cohort of uh, both pediatric adult patients uh, the pathology of the temporal lobe, but particularly the pathology of the hippocampus uh, and these patients with a uh, new onset status epilepticus, a pathology of the hippocampus, which is also reproduced in an experimental model of a status epilepticus. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed also in the other uh, report, it's clear that we are dealing, if we use basic staining, uh, with a variable pattern of neurola injury, uh, which depends uh, not only on the etiology treatment, but uh, as often uh, depending on the duration on the severity of status epilepticus. So with the neuronal injury, which affect uh, for sure the hippocampus uh, and the neurons of the hippocampus, but can be extended to other brain regions, amygdala, entorhinal cortex, cerebellum, even brainstem. And we are dealing not only with uh, neuronal injury, loss of neurons, uh, but also, uh, as we just saw in the previous uh, presentation, activation of other cells, the non-neuronal cells, microglia, astrocytes. In some cases, we can have also lymphocytic infiltrates. Uh, this is a um, case of a young uh, girl who died at the age of four, and this is uh, the hippocampus, uh, the high magnification in the more vulnerable region, with basic staining we can only see that there is a severe neuronal cell loss. And the other cells that we see here, the non-neuronal cells, the astrocytes. So actually what we see throughout the report uh, based on the post-mortem material uh, as a commonality is the neuronal injury associated always with the activation of astrocytes and microglia. These are two examples from our diagnostic biodepository. So a young male who died at the age of 20, uh, 48 hours after new onset refractory status epilepticus, so cryptogenic. So here in the region of the hippocampus, you see reactive astrocytes, activated microglia. The neuronal injury and the activation of the glial cells is more pronounced and extensive in the case that I showed before the four years old girl who died 27 days after uh, uh, refractory status epileptic. Also here, not etiology was identified. This is the image which highlights the activated microglia. And you see that the specific regions of the hippocampus are more stained, so they are really reactive uh, microglia cells, but extending also to entorhinal cortex, the temporal cortex. In the regions as the CA1, there is also activation of astrocytes. But there is more. 
And so in, uh, there is also a blood-brain barrier dysfunction. In this case, we use a, a, a surrogate marker albumin showing uh, the leakage of albumin, the uptake in astrocytes. And uh, you can find uh, in different cases, some lymphocytic infiltrates that are mainly perivascularly located with the population mainly represented by cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes. Um, that there is a, a, also the possibility as we did is to look at specific inflammatory uh, pathway. Uh, we look uh, uh, at the interleukin gua beta HNGB1 signaling, which has been already studied the address in the north and fires. Uh, this is just an example of how the receptor is upregulated and expressed in glial cells, actually in astrocytes. Uh, also, the HNGB1, the important pro-inflammatory molecules, uh, uh, is activated uh, in the pathological regions. Uh, and we see here the uh, translocation of the signal from nucleus to the cytoplasm uh, in glial cells, uh, particularly in astrocytes. So we have evidence of a pathology actually of astrocytes, uh, and this is also supported by the upregulation of adenosine kinase. It is a key enzyme uh, in astrocytes in the metabolism of uh, adenosine. And we know from previous study that if you have an upregulation of this enzyme, you will have adenosine deficiency. And this, at least also in the chronic phase, may support the epileptogenic network, but may also contribute to the comorbidity. So this is an aspect which could be of interest for the long-term consequence for the comorbidity. Uh, we look also back at our uh, diagnostic biodepository to identify a few cases. Actually, there are five, six cases uh, of a new refractory status epilepsy, which we include in a few studies, for example, to confirm the activation of the innate immune system, always associated with broad brain barrier dysfunction. Uh, there is also evidence in this case uh, of alteration of extracellular matrix uh, uh, through activation of uh, upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases, uh, MMP2, 3, 9 in the hippocampus. And we know that these molecules are really important to support and contribute to the pro-inflammatory response uh, uh, and also blood brain barrier dysfunction. We also use this case uh, to evaluate other aspects which could be important also in the long-term consequence and comorbidity, the dysregulation of iron metabolism, which actually accumulation in the hippocampus of iron, which uh, uh, is uh, also pro-epileptogenic and may contribute to neuronal dysfunction also long-term. But all these cases are based on the uh, use of a fixed paraffin embedded material. So we could not uh, perform really, really large uh, scale transcriptional study as we do uh, for other uh, epilepsy associated pathology. A transcriptomic approach, as we saw in the previous presentation, could be of uh, interest uh, and uh, really of great value also in the context of uh, heterogeneous condition as NORS. Uh, if we have a large number of samples, we can combine transcriptomic approach with system biology to identify, as we do for other pathology, convergent biology to better define the underlying mechanism to identify target. But this approach may help also the selection of target. So one aim for the future, if you have a, a, a material which could be used for this study, is the identification of uh, underlying drivers and regulators at the level of the network. So the disease-related gene expression signature. So once that you identify the signature, then you can eventually apply network-based uh, drug discovery, try to modulate uh, or to restore, uh, uh, normalize the network. If you have frozen materials, we saw in the previous presentation, and we do for the other epilepsy associated pathology, you can perform with a single nuclear RNA sequencing, which could be also important in the interpretation of the bulk sequencing data to identify subpopulation of cells. We are particularly interested based on the neuropathological evidence on the phenotype of astrocytes and microglia. But uh, you can also apply new technology. I'm thinking about a special transcriptomic. It is a recent paper which show within special transcriptomic uh, um, new techniques as DNA nanobulb pattern array, which really give a, a high quality signal at the single cell level, preserving the spatial uh, uh, um, information. And this is an erodence, uh, but uh, in a pilot experiment has been shown uh, with our collaborators that can be also uh, applied to human cortex. 
So uh, I think I hope that I convince you that uh, uh, the, of the value of the human brain tissue, whether it's uh, clinically, neuropathologically well characterized, but particularly properly collected. So we need to start with harmonization of protocols. We need to start uh, based on collaborative network as we do today. And this is essential uh, uh, for long-term sustainability of a biodepository uh, and for dealing with rare disorder. And uh, in the case of the neuropathology, uh, we are, I already mentioned that uh, we, uh, uh, we would like to include post-mortem material. So it's really important to identify barriers and facilitators to post-mortem neuropathological examination. With this, for the last two slides, I give the words to Anita uh, to uh, introduce the protocol, which I have to say are the results of the effort, the collaboration between North Institute and Yale University. Anita? Hello. First of all, thank you so much um, for the honor to be here. It's a great pleasure to see you all and to be able to um, listen in on all these talks. Um, I am directing a biorepository at Yale. I have done this for many years and for uh, so I have experience. And so for, for this particular um, topic, um, I developed a protocol that would take into account that we're dealing with um, brains um, when they come to autopsy with varying sizes. The, the idea was to have a standardized approach to it. And so when we, the, the, op, the options are for sampling are to receive biopsy material, which is from the operating room. That material is uh, either frozen or and fixed. Um, when the, when the sample is large enough, then the uh, attempt is made to do both because then you have most options for investigation. When um, a child or an adult unfortunately uh, dies, then we're extremely grateful when um, the next of kin agrees to um, a brain donation and it will be handled very carefully. Um, in the autopsy will be will be performed by professionals in a clinical setting, and we have developed here a very standardized approach. Um, and this slide here illustrates how the it is handled. So the brain, first of all, we are in close uh, communication with the clinician to identify whether there are any lesions that might have led to the, um, um, you know, the, the, the disease. And so we are collecting the lesion uh, particularly. If there is no identifiable lesion and the brain um, then is, is um, simply subdivided into half, whereas one half is, fixed in formalin, which is then like, like Eleonora Il has shown so beautifully uh, undergoes this, this wide array of immunohistochemical analysis and other tests. And then the other half, which is a complementary half is then frozen and sliced also. And the frozen half then opens an additional many doors to very elegant scientific investigation. And I have developed a protocol here whereby the brain half that's frozen is sliced based on neuroanatomic landmarks so that each slice always has the same um, brain region. This is important later on for when, the, when these uh, slices have to be retrieved and then sent to scientists. Um, so it's done in a very standardized way. So the corpus callosum is used as internal landmark. The brain is then sliced into 12 slices. Um, the, cere the cerebellum is sliced into four slices and then the um, brain stem. And with that, we always have a very standardized um, a slicing mechanism, which will take into account whether the brain is um, coming from a child or from an adult. Um, this protocol has been proven to be very helpful also for the Alzheimer's disease research center that I run. So it's, it's, it's uh, tested and has proven to be very valuable. And so to, to summarize, um, to um, make, 
to, to really optimize research uh, studies, all possible options are uh, kept open, which is to utilize tissue in fixed form, but also in frozen form. Um, when some when there is an institution with a patient outside, I am always available to advise them on how to handle this. If they're unsure, there always is the option to just send the entire brain to us with FedEx. Then we do the dissection here at Yale. Usually these brains are with us within 12 to 24 hours, and this is still okay. And so we just want to make sure that none of these very valuable cases uh, is lost, but instead is utilized maximally. So families and patients benefit later on. I'd be happy to take any questions should they arise or be, um, I'm also Great. available to, um, by email. Great, thank you very much, Eleonora and Anita. Um, I think there were a couple of questions in the chat. There were some conversations Go, Feel free to put your comments in there as well, but in the name of time, we're gonna move on. Uh, next, we have Jorge Cespedes is gonna give a uh, short presentation on a recent analysis of seasonality of Norse. Uh, Jorge, did you, you wanna share your screen or you want me to? show the slide i can share the screen let me see uh, there you can see it or that is yep. the perfect okay very good so it is really a privilege for me to present to you this is a very humbling experience but as i said as well it has been a privilege to work with so many people during this this past month jorge cespedes i am originally from costa rica and this is a study that we're doing in the, on the seasonality of NORS. Margaret Gopal, who is a senior research coordinator at the Epilepsy Center, has collaborated a lot. And as well, Dr. Gofton, Dr. Gaspar, Dr. Hirsch, we have come together and I have heard tremendous advice for them in this study. In, we know that in recent years, there has been incredible progress in the, in the study of NORS. You see all these publications, and even when we go to databases like Scopus, PubMed, it is incredible the explosion in the last five years. Hundreds and, well, dozens and even almost hundreds of publications that are coming. But it's still the cost remain uncertain. The seasonality of NORS is something that it is worth to explore because it might suggest infectious, by infectious causes, but still it has not been examined properly, maybe because there has been a lack of data. And in this study, that is what we try to do, to put together as much data, as much cases that we can, and investigate that seasonality among patients with NORS. What we did here is we combined three different databases of NORS patients. I can say that maybe it's one of the biggest data, database sets that we can have right now, because we have a total of 216 cases, but we are combining here pediatric and adult cases. I'll tell you in a minute where all these cases come, just one of the limitations is because many of these databases, uh, you know, the data is actually no identified, it's unidentified data. So it may be some overlapping of cases with one or, or another of the database. The first source is the North Bio Repository here at Yale. That is the current prospective observational study. We got 50 cases from there. Then from the North Family Registry, so you know it's an online uh, only data bank. We got from there 54 cases. And from a retrospective database from a prior publication by Dr. Gaspar in 2015, we got from there 112 patients. So a total of 216. And after we were deciding what the statistical analysis to, you, to use, we went with a quite square goodness of fit test. This is to try to determine that there is a difference in the incidence of NORS. You know, there is a, a change really that is significant in, in, of what we expect on the incidence of cases. The first thing we did, we aggregated all the cases by month. There was a peak of in, incidence, as you can see in March, we had 24 cases. 
January or April, we have 12 cases, and we may say, yes, there is an incidence, there, is, there are bigger numbers in one month than other, but when we did the analysis, this incidence, this difference, sorry, is not a statistical significant. So what we did after that was to group all the data, to aggregate all the data, and we did an analysis by season, we base this analysis in on the astronomical season that is based on the equinox and the solstice, because you know that that can be different defined depending where, where we are. When we found that here, for example, in summer, as you can see, and these are probably our main findings in the study, in summer we have 70 cases, in spring we had 40. And when we did that statistical analysis, this difference seems to be significant. We have the p-value of 0.04, but it seems, what I said, once again, it confirms the significance in the difference of the incidence in the numbers of incidence in cases of NORS in these different seasons. What we can conclude from this, these, of course, are very preliminary findings of seasonal patterns, but there, these are findings. We have, as I said, more cases in summer, fewer cases in the spring, but what is more important, it actually serves as a catalyst to promote further research, to continue thinking. We want to confirm or refute this seasonal link to, to NORS, but we need to do more studies for that. But we are able to do it, and we are able to confirm or deny this, especially if we confirm, we may come with some suggestions about particular etiologies, some specific infections or that may be triggers for NORS. I think it opens doors for many, many discussions. What we need probably are carefully designed protocols. And these protocols, we probably want to consider other variables, for example, geographical location, year. This can help us to look for outbreaks. And as well, all this has to be considered in that design of future studies. One last thing. I noticed that most of the cases that have been published on these databases, they mostly come from the Western, from the Northern Hemisphere, sorry, from the Western part of the Northern Hemisphere, United States, Canada, that is the case in Yale and other centers in Europe. I think that it will be curious to analyze the Southern Hemisphere. We're talking here, Chile, Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, that as well, they have a seasonal pattern of the weather in, in their weather to see and compare if as well, we can find a seasonality that is similar to what we are describing here. So thank you very much. You know, you can always contact me on my email. If you have questions or comments, suggestions, I will be very happy. Once again, it has been a privilege working with you all. Fantastic, thank you, Jorge. Um, there was a question that you answered, right, as it was asked about the hemisphere. Um, mm -hmm. And Andreas von Ballen actually put numbers in from his fired data yes uh huh. andreas you want to make a comment on that did, did it match i guess so we saw more in summer fewer in spring i don't know if andreas can unmute and make a comment uh, but it looks like uh Answer is sort of no. So summer was only it looks third, like third, yeah. third place. I don't know what frilling is. Is that spring? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's spring. That's spring. Uh, so yeah, there were the fewest in spring. So that that part matched, but the peak did did not. Uh, interesting. So I collected. So I think it's more the. Um, um, depends on the uh, virus or infection uh, uh, in the season, uh, but uh, so I, I have the same uh, opinion of the chart that it's uh, more um, uh, depends on the uh, virus. Uh, this is uh, in, in the season and not. So good. So maybe grouping all of them is not going to identify it. Yeah, well, that's where we are. As Jorge mentioned you might look for specific outbreaks in location in specific years and locations as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, so far we don't have the numbers to do that kind of thing. But, okay, thank you very much, Jorge, for that a nice presentation. So um, I'm going to try again to share. Okay, so I get the final uh, 
little section. So just want you've heard a little bit about this uh, biorepository at Yale, maybe more than a little. But we, we've now set, set it up um, and it's actually up and running as of now. Um, so the purpose is to collect, anal analyze, store, and share biospecimens and the data, including all the results, um, patients with Norse of any age, including fires from anywhere in the world. Um, you've heard we're developing standardized procedures, not just for the neuropathology, but for uh, all, all the other tissues and fluids as well. Um, and then other places can have their own repositories. We'll probably be at least one in Europe uh, or, or multiple, um, but we're trying to standardize the way everything is collected and keep all the information in the same databases. Um, and the idea is to have all results made available to all qualified researchers. Um, and anyone who uses samples from this biorepository will have to give the results back to the database for sharing. So it's just going to move the field forward as efficiently as possible. Um, just some practical issues. Um, Yale will be taking care of all the consent. It's all done remotely from anywhere in the world. We send a short form and I mean, it'll be the family uh, agreeing to this. And then we will have communication with that center about how to prepare and ship all the materials and Yale will pay for it through the Norse Fires funding. Um, we'll database everything. Our current ongoing prospective multi-center trial will be folded into this. Although those patients, we get very, very detailed clinical information. So much more than we'll be taking from the rest of the world. Um, and then we have a steering committee that will be reviewing requests to use the samples. Um, the plan is to have quarterly meetings. Um, so I'm the principal investigator um, the, and the steering committee will make all the uh, big decisions about how to handle specimens and wh where to send them and when to send them. This is the steering committee. You've, you've met uh, most of these people today. I'm not, not gonna read them all. Uh, but it's a mix of different expertise. Um, and this is a busy slide, but it's showing all the things that we plan to run on every case that we get. Um, and we have uh, funding to run. The, the N is for the number that we have funding for. So we have funding to run 100 cases uh, from blood looking for autoantibodies and uh, and metagenomics both to be done at UCSF. Uh, we're also gonna be doing whole genome sequencing through the Yale Center for Genomic Analysis. We're gonna be doing the cytokine analysis that you heard already talking about. Um, and on a few cases, we have funding for about five cases, we're gonna do the uh, single cell RNA sequencing when we can get really acute uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. As far as the spinal fluid, we're doing the uh, autoantibodies from UCSF, the metagenomics. Uh, by the metagenomics is actually only on CSF, not, not blood. Um, and then as Aureli mentioned, some of the cytokines we're gonna run quickly and give the results back to the referring centers as we're hoping this will be useful for them and help us uh, kind of be incentive for sending us samples. Uh, there'll be all kinds of disclaimers that this is for research only, but um, it might be helpful for you clinically nonetheless, because I know we have, uh, it's very hard to get CSF cytokine analysis commercially, probably impossible for, for most of us. Um, so we're going to be able to provide that in just a couple of days. Um, and then we'll be doing the single cell RNA sequencing for a few cases on the CSF as well. Brain biopsies. Uh, we estimated three to five a year that we'll be getting and analyzing them the way you heard about. And we will be collecting a bunch of other fluid for now, they're just being stored. So if somebody wants to research on that, we will have the samples. And then there's just simple clinical data as a one page sheet of basic information and the rest, we're just gonna get medical records, including MR images and uh, EEG tracings when we can. Uh, this is the first time we've said this publicly, but we are now accepting samples. So contact Jorge or myself uh, if you have them. In addition, we're hoping to be able to use as many pre-existing specimens as we can, uh, but we're gonna do that on a case-by-case -case basis and talking with 
looking at the timing, the exact clinical details, and talking with uh, the neuropathologist about uh, uh, and the other other people about whether the samples will be useful or not, uh, depending on how they were stored and when. Um, and then for the researchers who want some samples, there's a simple application uh, that's available. We can send it to you. It'll, we'll post it on the website very soon. And again, all those people will have to agree to share the data back eventually. Uh, they obviously get to publish it first. Um, so that's the plan for the biorepository, which is finally up and running. And uh, lastly, I want to thank Nora and Raymond Wong, not only for financial support, but Nora has really been the driving force for a, a lot of what happens through the Norse Institute, including these symposia. And she's just been immensely helpful at every step of the way. Um, and I did want to, again, thank uh, Jorge in particular for arranging today and learning how to do all this fancy features of uh, Zoom. And uh, other than my difficulties, it's gone it's gone very well. So thank you to Jorge as well. Uh, and thanks to all our speakers uh, today and for uh, particularly to all the family members who joined today. Remember, we have the family conference tomorrow. So uh, please join that as well. Then all the researchers are invited to that. Uh, so technically, we're out of time and everybody feel free to sign off. But I'm also going to open up for anyone who wants to stay on and uh, ask questions. We can do that as well. Um, you can either raise your hand or put something in the chat. and We'll try and address it. So thank you, everyone. I'll stop sharing. And Nora, did you want to make any parting comments? Uh, no, that was excellent. I, since there are just a few minutes, there are a couple of questions about, in particular, about um, standardized method for preserving brain tissue. Problems with that? I don't know whether um, Anita wants yeah. to address that. And I, I just a brief comment. The the biggest pro mistake that's made is not preserving anything. So if the tissue is large enough or if there's an autopsy, the willingness to have tissue stored fixed or and frozen um, is um, ideal. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Anita. And if you fix, uh, uh, try to fix uh, uh, not longer than uh, two weeks uh, uh, for embedding because then the quality of the material uh, will get worse for uh, if you want to do in situ hybridization or other technique. And Nicholas, you had want to make a comment? Um, I may have missed it, but I, I think we forgot to thank the Neurocritical Care Society uh, that endorsed the meeting. I totally forgot during the Oh, meeting. shoot. Yeah, we had a couple, uh, couple slides that had their... Uh, logo on it. But yes, the Neurocritical Care Society uh, was kind enough to endorse this meeting, which was very nice and helpful. Thank you, Nicholas, for that pointing out that oversight. I was supposed to be a backup and mention that if Nicholas didn't. Me too. Uh, do, do you, uh, Marios? Hi, hi. Good afternoon to all. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, uh, one question for, for the neuropathology team and also one request about the samples as we have uh, discussed. Maybe we can take this out of the meeting, the second question. But the first question uh, is if, because when we do sometimes biopsies, uh, we may put the material in RNA later for, for metagenomics that we now do by default in all these patients anyway, even if we have very, very little suspicion of uh, uh, infection. Uh, is are you able to do transcriptomics on a on a frozen sample? Um, and do you prefer the sample in RNA later, or do you prefer the sample to be frozen immediately? And then how many degrees? Minus twenty, minus eighty. Yeah, normally is both are good. Uh, RNA later is a good quality, but also if you don't have the possibility to do uh, frozen uh, uh, shortly and then uh, keep a minus eighty. Rapid yeah. frozen, keep minus 80 for long storage. For short storage, if you don't have a minus 80, can be minus 20, but then minus 80. Thanks, Eleanor, for taking that. Uh, 
Andy, call. Have you got a? Yeah, um, Nick just sort of answered it in the uh, in the chat. I was wondering what the sense of the community is these days about about biopsy in relatively typical cases. So obviously, it serves a, it's a major factor for the research effort. But in terms of clinical care, is it standard? Are most of these patients getting biopsied? Is it exceptional? I know we get a fair amount of resistance from our neurosurgeons and neurology and neuropathologists around uh, diagnostic biopsies because they feel there's a very low yield. Just wondering what the general practice is in the community at this point. Well, I believe it's not that common to be getting brain biopsy still. It's like less than 10% of patients, but um, somebody else have an answer they want to add. Just go ahead and uh, any, uh, Marios, you had a comment about that? I can tell you, yes, I agree. It's, it's not a common practice. And actually the two biopsies that we have actually was the two children where we did the brain stimulation. So we got the biopsy from the tract of the of the electrode. Mm -hmm. um, although we, we, we cannot say there was any specific um, MRI changes that would guide us better anyway. Um, and, you know, as you know, most of the times anyway, it's not informative. But as I said, sometimes there is cases, we have had cases actually also referred to us from other hospitals where, because it's a very generic definition of the fires, they may, you may have patients who present with encephalopathy and seizures in ICU and people can put a label of fires. And then in any atypical cases where we are not quite convinced, we always go for brain biopsies. We have very low threshold here for brain biopsy. It's, it's difficult. I think it depends on how much this biorepository is going to yield, because if there is a request from the community that actually you may find, you may start finding things with biopsies, then they may become also standard of care. And I don't see a problem, you know, to get biopsies in these patients. They're already very, very sick and the biopsies are, is a very safe procedure, I think. Yeah, yeah, no. as, as we learn more and we, if it turns out the type of T cells you're seeing there or something else about the tissue can guide treatment, it'll be a totally different story. So yeah. whether whether we're there now, you can say you're actually gonna, it's gonna affect your management of a given patient is a little tough. I mean, I'm sure over the years, we've biopsied half a dozen or more of these cases. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it gets to this issue of separating the research and effort from the, the clinical care. And it's always a little bit of a tricky line to walk sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Don Black just put a reference, a very recent reference. Actually, it's from this month. Huh. Uh, the high diagnostic yield. Yeah. Huh. I mean, you it, biopsies also serve to rule out certain entities. Um, so th this negative information also is valuable. Um, I know Raquel's been waiting to say some, so let's give her a chance. And then Nicholas, after that. Thanks. I actually have a question. I wanted to uh, solicit the group's opinion regarding the uh, usage of ketamine as a continuous infusion uh, and uh, whether or not the, the folks feel like it is beneficial or efficacious for this particular patient population, more than the other continuous infusions. Hmm. Uh, we do use ketamine a fair amount, usually in combination with midazolam. Um, and certainly, if people are having any blood pressure issues, we'll go to that sooner. I don't know if, if maybe Emily, I don't know if she's still on, wanted, wanted to comment on it. Uh, but I, not nothing specific to Norse about that, just for refractory status. Anyone else have comments on ketamine? I know Nicholas has published on this. So. No, I think I think you're totally right. It, uh, there is nothing that suggests that ketamine might be more helpful in, in noise and fires than in any refractory um, cases. Uh, Seems like there's a lot of fans in the chat too. <laughs> yeah, we use a lot of it as well. Um, uh, Nicholas, were you going to make a different point? No, no. Uh, quickly back to to Andy's question. Uh, and actually, Andy, I'm, I'm going to take back what what I wrote in, in the chat. Um, for, for what it's worth, we just had a case, not here, in, in, but in, in a community hospital, um, uh, I was contacted to give my opinion on a case um, that looked very much like, like Norse uh, with MRIs that showed encephalitis-like changes 
uh, the MRI was repeated several times. The CSF was taken several times, never showed any inflammation. Um, patient did not respond to steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange. I finally said, well, why don't you take a look at what's inside the brain and you know, do a biopsy? And, and, and the, the report actually came out yesterday and it's glioblastoma. Hmm. Um, and, and, and I looked I looked at the literature this morning and, and there are a few cases of glioblastoma that look like uh, encephalitis on, on MRI. Uh, initially. Um, so I'm not sure it's going to change much in the, in the patient course, but uh, it will certainly change the treatment uh, in, in this patient. Sure. sure. So I, I agree with, and, 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 the, and the publication that, that Tom just shared is, is my experience biopsy. It's, it's usually very safe. We haven't oh, seen yeah. any catastrophes. And, and so, yeah, it, 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 might, it, might, it, might, it might be helpful, even, even if it looks very, very typical. I mean, it, it, as I said, it helps excluding things like glioblastoma. Then you have um, at least a few avenues to treat. And Andy, if you wanted the number, Ronnie put in 7.6% of NORS cases were biopsied in a meta-analysis from, from Austria. Huh. I know you like numbers. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to marshal arguments to do more biopsies, frankly, because I think that's the only way we're going to get, uh, maybe not the only way, but it's an important way to make progress here. And uh, so, you know, I'd like to be able to come back to the group and say, hey, guys, this really, uh, this really should be part of the workup. All right. Well, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We think we could, uh, it's, it's great having all these experts together, putting comments in the chat the whole time too. I learned a lot. All right, I have to get off the clinic. Um, I will leave it on if anybody wants to chat amongst themselves, but I'm gonna thanks. sign off. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye now.